think one of the best ways is as you drive around in neighborhoods and you see buildings, look at those signs. Every one of those buildings have a has a ton of signs up that has every single company name on it. Those are the people doing the developments. What better place should you start than your backyard with folks that are doing the work right now? So start with looking at very practical way. When you drive around, take a picture of the signs, look them up, find people on LinkedIn, whether they're black, women, find some commonality and try to, you know, get in with them. Whether it be the architect, the construction company, the engineers or the developer, all of them work with developers all the time. They know developers don't say, oh, I don't want to reach out to the architect because I don't want to do that. Architects build for developers, literally. They have a whole network of them. So if you build a rapport with one, they can introduce you to their role of All right, guys. Welcome back. Yes. EYL. Uh, this is very rare air. Yeah. We, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let's start gosh. there. <laughs> very rare that we, we, well, nowadays especially, is not easy to earn your leisure has become kind of like a big deal for people to get on that's an understatement uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. so to get on once is an accomplishment but to get on twice is an extremely rare feat only a handful of people have ever graced the show twice yeah a handful of people um i try to run off the names but we didn't I, even make it to a hand we didn't even get to five fingers uh, not a lot so um brandon rule we did this episode probably December. Two and a half years ago, something December like that. December 2019. December 2019. Yeah, was, December 9th, to be exact. Because we had did the event December yes. 9th. And that was the, we did a triple yeah, so interview exactly day. We was, we was in DC. <laughs> and we shot some content. And he was one of the people that we shot. And um, at the time, it went crazy. He was talking about real estate development. I think he might have been the first real estate developer that we've had on. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of giving a breakdown of real estate development, how it works, how he got started, how you get paid as a real estate developer, um, affordable housing, a variety of different things. And he, since then, he has done a lot of new construction and, and new development. Mm -hmm. So we talked about the time he had a $45 million grocery store mixed use property 24,000 square foot units. 150 units in Madison, Wisconsin. Yeah. And now that's completed, right? Yes. And then you also are work currently working on 2,000 units in Birmingham, Alabama. Yes. With 900 the affordable? No, so it's really like 1,500 affordable, but in one of the developments 920 is a part of that choice neighborhood grant that we'll talk about. Okay. Yeah. And then you have 142 units in Milwaukee. Yes. That's over a hundred million dollar project. That one's well, 140 units, but it's about 42 million. That's okay. the Harbor yeah. District. Harbor District. Okay. And then so. you have you have a project in Houston, Texas. Yeah, 340 units there. That's about a hundred million. So, <laughs> add those numbers up with the <laughs> ones we said before. <laughs> So it's a lot. It's a lot. So, so yeah. So you were not <laughs> looking at one smart black boy. So yeah. So I felt like it would be good to have a follow up conversation. Appreciate you. Earned. Talk, talk about yeah, yeah, what you got going now in real estate development and what you've learned over the last couple of years and provide information and insight. So first and foremost, thank you for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you all, man. Uh, before we jump in, though, I want to say thank you all too. You know, we did this December 9, 2019. And y'all were an emerging company. Everybody knew the brand, you know, but um, y'all are established now. So I appreciate y'all still respecting what I have going on and inviting me. But I want to give y'all y'all flowers too, man. Like what y'all did for the culture. So many people come up to me regularly. Yo, you changed my life on mm -hmm. some, hey, I never got into development. I didn't know what this was. Like I'm thinking about investing, et cetera, et cetera. And I know y'all get it too. But, um, you know, the lion's share of that probably came from that exposure that they got through this interview. So appreciate the platform y'all created and what y'all doing for the coach. We appreciate, right, appreciate that. It, appreciate uh, you. And to this day, man, that episode was one of the, you know, you, you have some episodes when you're familiar with an area and so you're asking questions because you want to get more knowledge. And then there's some episodes where you're not really familiar and one, one of your, was yours. And it was like, wow, that was, we were just blown away by it. So thank you. And thank you for showing up. Not just for this interview, but every time we've called on you, you've been at multiple events. Sometimes you, we see you out and it's yeah. like, yo, what's going on? It's always love. So I just want to thank you Absolutely. for being a genuine person that you that we met in December of 2019 to this day. I appreciate it. With everything that. you've accomplished. That means a lot, too, because I feel the same about y'all. Yeah, and you just came off the Invest Fest yes, stage. Yes, he did. Yes, sir. Legendary. Yes, he did. It was an honor. It was a privilege to be up there. Legendary <laughs> Invest Fest. 20,000 people was in attendance. That was a monumental uh feet and uh you definitely 
tore the stage down. Yes. The real estate development panel. So that's something that, you know, we appreciate as well. Well, I want to make sure folks know if they haven't saw it, they could catch the replay. That's a fact. $99 <laughs> on the website. That's good. good. Please. That's, check it out good. You that's why he's We're with us, y'all. this one for free, but you got to pay for that. <laughs> that's a fact. Come on, y'all. That's a fact. <laughs> um, I bet. So let's get into it. So let's start with the Madison project, yeah. right? So when we first spoke, you would, you just started the project. Now it's done. So the grocery store aspect is something that's important for, for sure. the communities of every community, but especially, you know, black communities mm -hmm. and um, communities that have been disenfranchised. So you, you put together that it's a mixed use of grocery store and um, actually housing. So talk about start to finish some of the challenges that you faced, um, obstacles and why that project is important and why it's important for Madison, Wisconsin, which a lot of people don't even know Madison, Wisconsin actually has a black population. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Pretty sizable. Pretty One of the most right? disenfranchised ones in the country too. Yeah. So talk about that project and just kind of give us the lay of the land on that. So yeah, like you said, you know, 150 units uh, above a grocery store. So you go to larger metropolitan cities, you'll see this combination growing, right? Grocery store with housing above. What you don't typically see is affordable housing above a grocery store. It's typically market rate because in the majority of those areas, grocers look for higher income at the end of the day. It's one of the lowest margin businesses that you can have out there. So if you're in an area of poverty and people are, you know, it's a higher rate of theft that decreases your margins. So it was a very difficult time finding a grocer that wanted to actually be in the area. I mean, I talked to all these. I talked to um, Trader Joe's, Whole Foods, you name it. I talked to all of them and they're like, nah, we're not interested. And ironically, Kroger had just purchased a pick and save next door when they were shutting it down because it wasn't a part of their expansion and their footprint. They're opening new stores, but this one, they're like, nah, we're out. So this RFP was from the city of Madison and said, hey, we need a grocery store and we want to do housing. So I competed. RFP is the request for a proposal. Good okay. point. So the city put out hey, we have three and a half acres worth of land. We want someone to come in and develop this. Someone sent it to me. I'm like, all right, cool. Let me check it out. At that time, um, I was thinking about doing a 9% tax credit deal or a 4% tax credit deal. It's two different ones. One is competitive, one's not. And the 9% round, based on the time in which they put it out, was already passed, so I would have had to wait a year. What I did creatively was put it as a 4% deal because I had more time to submit that. And I actually got my application in and was able to deliver a year before anybody else. So talk about what does that mean, 4% tax credit deal? So the long income housing tax credit is broken out into two different things, 9% and 4%. It's a very complex structure, to be honest. So I won't even like get into it heavily, but at the 9%, 70% in theory of all the total development costs will be funded by that. And then on the 4%, 30% of your total development costs will be funded by that. So if you think about, okay, cool, I have a deal that's $100 million. I'm getting $70 million from this tax credit. I'm getting $30 million from this tax credit, just to keep it simple. So most were looking at it from the 9% perspective because you get more credits. But I was thinking about how do we creatively do it quicker with the 4%. And Wisconsin had just introduced a state credit that mirrored the 9%, all this extra stuff. But I ended up creating value by saying, okay, let me financially engineer this thing so I can outpace all of my competitors. There were four, I think, primary applicants or four finalists at the time when we responded. I was one of the four. And then I went to a ton of community meetings. I mean, I'm out there getting there at 6, 7 p.m., leaving at midnight, like literally staying there, waiting to the last single person left, answering every single question. So I was like building with the community as much as I could. And Ended up getting it awarded in December of 2019, ironically, right around the time we were talking about it. No, it must have been like September. Q3, Q4 of 2019 is when I got it awarded from the city. But that was just the first step. Once you get the land awarded, you got to go and actually like put the financial plan together. So then I'm applying for tax credits. So when we did our interview, I got the land under contract, but I had to go out and apply for the tax credits. So I applied for that, ended up getting it awarded, found a grocer. It didn't work out with that grocery. It was a black and Latino led grocery store. So you had an all black 
you had a black led development team. I partnered with a local nonprofit and then we had a black and Latino grocery store and we had so much flack. I mean, from wow, come on. government, everybody, no, nah, the government was on my side. Community? Luckily the mayor wanted to see the black developer, you know, move forward. It was a community. Yeah. yeah. Some parts of the community. So this one, let's put, let's say it's a circle, right? 60% of this circle is black community. You know, 20% is Hmong. And there was a white community there. You said Hmong? Yeah, like Asian. Okay. Yeah, they were like, it's a Hmong Asian community over there as well. There's like Mongolia? What's Hmong uh, mean? I don't know where it was. What, what's, what's Hmong mean? I never heard that before. That's a, that's a good That's point. like an acronym? No, nah, it's, it's like a ethnicity almost. Okay. So, you know, it's kind of like. Ty, go on the Google search on this one. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> Let's do that. Let's, Mom. let's not get us banned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a fact. But but yes, it's an Asian community. It was, it's black. It's multi black, black, yeah. Asian, Hispanic, et cetera. But this small um, kind of white community was very supportive and it was more affluent than some of the other neighborhoods around. It was very supportive, but there was a couple bad apples that were like intentionally trying to pull it down because they didn't want me to succeed, which ironically, I won't say the names of some of the organizations, but leading black led organizations in this country in the world were fighting against me doing this development what why this is it was the most irrational thing what, what was their reason that they were saying they just wanted another develop the the majority developer that was local they thought he was a better fit to be the developer was he black of course not that that's interesting the the, the race part is one thing yeah but even for us like even now dealing with like real estate and dealing with developers that that's an issue but dealing with municipalities is an issue too you said the mayor was on your side yes talk about that process because i'm sure there was challenges dealing with municipalities trying to get this development off yeah it was typically there is but this one actually not many they were fully on my side because the rfp came from them they had a vested interest in moving this forward too they wanted to see the grocery store. Okay. They appreciated that it was a black developer coming into a city that was black and had a tremendous amount of black issues. And they wanted to see me grow and prosper. I found a local nonprofit that I could partner with because they knew the local lay of the land a little better. They knew where the pockets of money were in Dane County and the city of Madison, et cetera. So the municipalities were actually great. It was not an issue with them at all. They were fully, to this day, I have a call today with them about the grocery store. And to this day, Dan Ropes, who I met with, he's been phenomenal across the board. He's staff level at the city. So when, They've when, been great. When you're fighting the power, well, the people that were trying to stop this and derail the development, how are you facing this? Like, How are you meeting this challenge? I think just really forming relationships and allies. Uh, having the Common Council with you so every city there's a mayor and then there's a council that governs like all of the decisions that are made so in this development there was one i was in one's district but across the street was another district so those two council people in in particular were very influential in like keeping their constituents at bay again there were a couple bad apples that was like nah we just don't want him to do it for no reason i mean they just thought that i couldn't do it to be honest i was it I knew I could do it. Clearly it's done, so it got done. But other than me being a young black developer, they just didn't want that. But having those allies in the city definitely helped me overcome some of those challenges. So, okay. So you get the political support, but now you have to actually, and it didn't have to be a grocery store. That was just your idea? No, they wanted it. <coughs> so wanted part of the, yeah, that's a good point. The request for proposal that they put out, they got these three and a half acres. We want a grocery store at the bottom, and something above. So it didn't have to be housing. It didn't have to be affordable housing. Okay. That was but, just your idea. That was my idea. So, all right. So how do you, so once you get past the hurdles and, and you actually get to RFP, yeah. now you actually have to put the plan together. Yes. So you, you have to get the funding. Yes. And you have to get the grocery store. Yes. Correct. So how do you get the funding and how do you get the grocery store? So at the time of the submission with the RFP, you have to have an idea of what that plan is. And honestly, when you give it to them, it's got to be close enough to pass the smell test. But whatever you submit then is not really how it's going to end up. Mm -hmm. Like the articles at that time, 31 year old developer, I'm 34 now, I'll be 35 in a couple of days. 31 year old developer is developing a $41 million project. That project ended up being over 45 million. 
So that's a four million dollar delta. You know, that's a ten percent increase in construction costs or whatever, and you got to find the financing for it. So, based on all of the rents that come in, you can figure out what the value of that property is. The bank will give you a loan based upon the value. So they say, hey, we'll go since it's affordable, eighty five percent loan to value, mm -hmm. right? Now you have to find a 15% delta between that kind of loan value and what the rest is. But the challenge with affordable housing, I mentioned on the previous episode, is the value of that property is less than the cost of construction. So the value may only be 15 million, even though it costs 45 to build because you're restricting the rents. So now, okay, cool, I got, let's just call it 12 million of tax credit. It was probably closer to like 20, but let's just say 20 million in tax credits, 45 million total. Well, the loan might have only been 15. So $10 million loan, $45 million deal. You add about 20 so, 20 or so million in tax credits. So now I have 35. We condoed out the grocery store. We did not put it together. It's two different buildings on paper. It's the same structure, but it's two different entities. So the grocery store fortunately was purchased by the city the city of madison bought the grocery store back and they're now leasing the grocery space i don't have that risk anymore it's a lot of value there for me being a developer because if i was leasing that out and that grocery store failed i'm still on the hook for that loan as opposed to the city right. who use their funding dollars they don't have a loan they just can lease it out and make sure that that grocery store is successful so we were paid 4.6, so that was another, let's just call it five. So, you know, you got 10 plus the 20 from the tax credit plus another five here, 35 or so. Now I need to find 10 million more dollars to fill this gap. Uh, the city of Madison ended up giving me a million and a half for the affordable housing piece. Uh, the city of Dane County gave me a little less than 2 million. Um, we applied for a federal home loan bank. They had this affordable housing program. We applied for that. We received 900,000, I think, from them as well. So you just go and find like all of these places to plug the gap. And then once you get it to a point where it's close enough, you defer. If my developer fee, my developer fee on that was <coughs> 5 million, but you have to defer at least half. We can talk about why later, but that two and a half Let's say I have a million dollar overrun. Now I got to refer, defer three and a half instead of two and a half. So you just find enough sources so you can make your fee and then the cash flows. But that's essentially what it is. You just go out and go to different cities, go to different counties and find different funding sources based upon whatever program you have. And affordability typically has some pockets of money out there. So the affordable housing piece, you didn't have to do that, like you said. But I know it's something that's personally. It was encouraged, but yeah, it's definitely yeah. purchased. So talk about that, right? Because you could have done commercial real estate. You're, I mean, super intelligent. You could have done commercial, <laughs> but you're doing more community real estate. So talk about why it's so personal to you and why you continue to go down that path. 100%. I mean, for that deal in particular, uh, some of the other proposals were student housing, because it's right by University of Wisconsin. You know, that's a huge university, 40 plus thousand people. You can make a lot more money doing that. But for me, it's like, my first deals were in my backyard. That's how I started. I'm like, yo, I want to develop in this area that is facing gentrification. And the fact that I started in community development, I'm going to never let that go. So I work really closely now with this guy, Egbert Perry. He's a genius. He was the former board chair of Fannie Mae. Like, coming out the recession, he's on the board of Penn. Just a dope, dope guy and developer. And one of the things he enlightened me on was there's a huge difference between community development and commercial real estate, right? So commercial real estate is, let's just call it capital P for profit and a small M, maybe no M for mission. You go, you make the money. It is what it is. It's transactional. Community development, on the other hand, is a very large M for mission, and it might be a small P for profit. So when I was starting off, everything I did was community development. When we spoke last time, everything I was doing was community development. But now I'm transitioning into commercial real estate because although I am passionate about the community development piece, it's difficult to build your entire business around that. Mm -hmm. So you have to have the balance. Y'all know, diversification right at the end of the day. So now I'm getting into more market rate stuff, whether it be studios that I'm developing or market rate housing, et cetera. I'm doing both. But really what I'm more so focused on is master plans where I can like commingle both in the same space. So the stuff that we're doing in Birmingham is a prime example of that. 
So, like, for people, um, you know, people always have criticisms. So they'll say, like, Sharon, your leisure, like, you're only interviewing rappers now. Like, what about, like, Diddy, he's, he's talking about liquor. That's not something that we need. We need <laughs> more grocery store stuff. For all of you, for all of you folks, this is something that actually is extremely important from the grocery store aspect and the housing aspect is probably the two most essential things in life, actually food and shelter. Absolutely. So this is a, a model that um, is actually very interesting to have a grocery store and then affordable housing on top of a grocery store. Do you think that this is something that can be duplicated? And if so, like for other people that might be interested, or like how, what's the blueprint for this model in disenfranchised neighborhoods? moving forward because like i said that actually is something that encompasses a variety of different things you know if we talk about food deserts yes so access to to food is extremely important and access to have somewhere to live is extremely important For so sure. if you can if you can knock out two birds with one stone that's mm -hmm. kind of a amazing accomplishment yeah, so great question, by the way. I think for that, there is a model for sure. I think you've seen it a little bit, but we should see more of it in the future. Uh, for anyone looking to do it, I think where you start is really understanding development first. Because if you don't get that, if the numbers don't work, we're just talking. Mm -hmm. Like, this isn't charity. It's business at the end of the day. And big, big business. Like, even community development is big, big business. We're talking hundreds of millions just in my portfolio. There's billions of dollars going out monthly to these type of deals that's not hey i want to do this type stuff so to answer that i think one understanding development and really community development one of the unique things from a macroeconomic perspective that i did in madison was that particular neighborhood is in an area that has like healthy connectivity around it so yeah the food desert may be leaving but there are other things there that this development being affordable is going to enhance some of those other things. The Urban League of Madison just put up a new building. There's a tremendous amount of new development nearby. So my recommendation would be find an area that is, yes, in a food desert, but the nicest area within that. Don't go to the worst area in the area, like that community and say, I want to do that here. It's probably not going to work from a numbers perspective. Find something on the fringes. If there's, let's say, a two mile radius that you're looking at, what is the best area within this two mile radius that you could still feel like connected to? Yeah, I'm doing this in my community, but it's closer to whatever catalytic development is around there. You want to always align yourself with something else that's going on. You don't want to build in like, I'm not saying you don't want to, but you don't want to build a from a business owner perspective. I don't want to own something that is retail specifically in an area that has no healthy community commu connectivity around it, start there and then move into those areas. So it's kind of like the reverse of gentrification almost, right? It's like, how do we go align with that stuff and then continuously like spread it to the other parts of the community? Gentrification isn't bad. Displacement is bad. Mm. Those are two different things. Mm. If we can b build and develop in our communities and not displace the people within it, it's beauty. So that's how you do it. You put the healthy, you look for what's healthy in that area of a food desert and put a plan in that area. And then it'll start to expand down to the other areas that need it the most. How, how much, I mean, you have the, the proof of concept, right? You've done this. So when you're doing this in Madison, before you get to the Harbor District, are you showing this to scale? I can do this. And now is it making that process easier for you? Number one. And number two, how many developments are you taking on at a time before it's like, maybe the can we handle this much workflow yeah that's a great question too so absolutely i think in wisconsin in particular i'm one of like i'm one of the biggest developers in the state you know regardless of race color age any of that right so when i pull up they they see my resume now that deal we just talked about with the grocery store that was the largest development in the state from a tax credit perspective that year this harbor district one that i just got in 2023 that's the largest one in the state that was funded so like I now have the track record where it's like, no, I'm standing on my own. And they they look at me as if I'm one of the historically, you know, white developers. Right. But I'm black and I'm coming with energy and mission and like community with me. So I think having that entire story helps. 
What also helps is Milwaukee has changed, man. Historically, it's been the worst place for black people, but the mayor's now black. The head of the county's black. The head of the WIDA economic development in the whole state of Wisconsin that was appointed by the governor is black. The pretty much all the positions of power, the head of that, you know, DCD, the community development arm that puts the money out is black. Head of CDBG funds is black. So it's like, it's a renaissance almost. It's like, okay, cool. Like we all are on that same wave. So it be, I don't have to sell it because they get it. So a lot of the areas, that's why I'm in Birmingham too. It's like, okay, Madison got it. Milwaukee gets it. Birmingham gets it. Atlanta gets it. DC gets it. Houston gets it. That's why I'm in these markets. I don't need to sell the fact that black people should be able to do good business, regardless of color. They get it. Mm -hmm. So the fact that I bring my resume and expertise, I can show just, hey, this is what I've done. This is what I do it for. And this is what I'm looking to do here in that respect. So you said last time, like in order for a developer to really get into the game, most times you have to like work under like a JV with an established developer, right? Absolutely. Yes. Um, so at what point can you branch out on your own and not have to ride with another person in, in the car? Uh, from a tax credit type perspective, so community development, let's break out community development and commercial real estate. Commercial real estate, if you have money, you can go tomorrow, you know, like a billionaire can literally go and hire development consultants and just put up a development if you wanted to. So you can do that with no problem. Community development, tax credit, I, I wouldn't recommend it because the returns are probably not going to be what you want them to be and they don't have the same vested interest in them. You don't know what's going on. You probably can lose your money. But you can do it from a community development perspective when you're trying to develop these communities and tax credit deals and affordable housing. Um, AHEC is the governing council of all tax credit equity investors. They set a standard that was a million dollars of liquidity and five million in net worth. So that's really the start and the finish. Again, to, if you to do money, what? To do develop? To, 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 be able to get the tax credit equity investor to allow you to be the developer. You have to have a million dollars in liquid and $5, five million, million dollar network. That's pretty much the, the standard. But as deals get larger, if you're doing a 50 plus million dollar deal, they're going to want to see a little bit more. And typically they want to see the experience, but like that is, if there was a benchmark, that would be it. And most of the time when we start out, million dollars of cash and or five million in net worth is not really there for folks so you got a jv and partner like we explained in the last episode to be able to get to that point so now like i'm there i'm doing like harbor district it's on my own i'm bringing in a good friend of mine who's been doing my development consultant michael and mem and we're just gonna partner on it i i stand on my own and everything but he's a brother that i really trust and respect so it's like no nah, let's just do this together so it's not like I needed him at all. And frankly, he doesn't need me, but it makes sense for us to like share, divide and conquer that. To answer your question earlier about like, how do you know when it's too much? Um, right now, I mean, it's only, I just hired my first person a couple months ago. It's been me this whole time, full time. That's why I don't put out this content. I'll just be working literally. Wow. Like I'm a staff of, I was, I've been a staff of one. I had people assisting and even the person that I hired, She's been helping for like two two years or so, but full time is just me and one other person right now. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. Like I am I I am primarily doing the work. It's not like I'm having team members do it. Like I'm at these community meetings. I'm meeting with the folks. I'm putting together the financial models. I'm looking at the construction plans. Like I'm doing yeah. it. When you when you broke down the financial model by square foot the last time we, we spoke, I was I mean that blew me away. And so I'm now looking at. You're going from 140 unit development to now in Birmingham, where we got 1,100 mixed unit. Yeah. Talk about scaling that and what that looks like for you since you're, I mean, you're talking about just being the sole person doing it. For sure. So partnerships, that's another key. Um, one, I knew, I felt the market was changing. I didn't know it would be this stark in terms of the interest rates, but I knew like we've been on the wave, like 08 hit, boom really from 2010 to like 21, 22, we've, that was a run that real estate hasn't seen. Real estate is cyclical. It goes up and it goes down. It's literally like this all the time. So I'm like, yo, it's, it's time that it's going to go down. So I intentionally didn't do any new developments. I was just working on the construction of 1402, 1887 in Montella. So I have right now three projects, little, around a little over 300 units under construction right now in Wisconsin. 
So I was like, let me just focus on that. But simultaneously, I was looking for how do I plan for the future where my time right now may not yield this return, but my time later will. So I started to reach out to that. I built a partnership with Integral and Egbert and their team. And I started looking at master plan developments. So that's what I was talking about before. I, I didn't really get hit by the recession much because all of my stuff was already kind of out the ground. It's just being built. All my financing is in order. I put a pause on anything new. But as I was pausing, I was working on this larger term stuff. So I ended up getting 1,100 units awarded that we're developing with Smithfield Court. That's in Birmingham. And we just received the $50 million grant on that. And I also got about 900 units awarded. Congrats. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> so that's about three, 300, with the market rate, so about 350 million in just 1,100. And then I have 900 units at Tom Brown in Birmingham that I'm developing as well. The way you can do that is like, I looked at capacity. We're doing the $50 million broken out into seven deals. I'm doing a deal a year for the next seven years. And when I talked about the funding gaps, right? Okay, you have the, the loan, you have the tax credit equity, but then you gotta fill the rest. The $50 million is the gap filler for the rest. So I have a pre, pre-funded seven deal run based on $50 million of a grant that was awarded from the federal government. So for me, that was capacity. Like I don't need to do seven, eight deals right now because I'm a small team. Mm -hmm. But if I could build seven, eight, nine, ten deals in my pipeline over however much time, that was the key. So I'm doing seven mark seven affordable deals for Birmingham and Smithfield with two market rate deals. And then the other one I have about seven phases. So every year I'm gonna do really two deals a year in Birmingham. So that secretary fudge is who the person you were yeah, working with? Secretary so Fuss. I mean, if people don't know, she she's the head of, of of her. She is. So how did you develop a relationship with her? Were you on her radar? Or did somebody introduce you? Because relationships are important. We always talk about that. When when did that relationship develop? You know what's interesting? Um, I knew people around, but I didn't meet her until the day she brought the award. <laughs> wow! I didn't meet her until that day. Uh, she brought the fifty million dollar check, and we you know met then. Prior to that, who does know her? Randall. Uh, Woodfin, Mayor Woodfin out of Birmingham, he knows her, you know, so it's relationships. Like you said, if the mayor knows her and the councilwoman knows her and we are all aligned in this development together, I mean, this is what we are pushing for at that point. I didn't need to know her because they knew her, you know, and I, I will say we put together one of the best proposals they've probably ever seen. It's super unique to get that choice neighborhood grant was it's been around for some years. It really was Hope Six first. Mm -hmm. So Egbert is the pioneer of Hope Six. HUD asked him, consulting on the model, et cetera. Now we have this, it's broken out into three tiers, housing, neighborhood, and people. Those three tiers are super important to HUD because it's not just about housing. Like you were saying earlier, like we need food, we need shelter. We're doing, we're moving a library, putting that into the development. We are also doing a social innovation campus that the city is going to run and govern. In our senior building, that's 101 units that we just applied for tax credits on. The lower level is an early childhood ed education center. So we have 101 seniors that will now volunteer with the kids. So the kids will be teaching the seniors and the seniors will be teaching the kids. Like there are models within models. It's not about the buildings. It's about, you know, the broader play. But HUD realized that the applicant was the Housing Authority of Birmingham District, 100 percent black led. The co-applicant is the city of Birmingham, 100 percent black led. The housing leads mm -hmm. is a partnership between rural enterprises and the integral group, 100 percent black led and owned. The scent project is running the people side. 100% black led, which is a subsidiary of Integral. And the neighborhood, again, is the city of Birmingham. First time we've ever seen one of these really, really large scale developments be 100% black, which I think tells a story. So that might've been why uh, yeah. Secretary Fletcher- uh, as, we, as you were saying, I'm thinking a common thing. We saw this happen in Milwaukee and we've seen it happen in Birmingham. We had the opportunity to sit down with Mayor Wolfen and he was telling us, like we were in Atlanta, but we flew over and he was like, look, Everything that they have, we can have here. 100%. And we can control it. So it was, when I saw you get awarded, that's why I mentioned you were watching Market Mondays. I'm like, this is incredible because I see this happening. It's a transition. Are there other cities that you are on the radar that you can see that there's a possibility for this type of infrastructure, this type of, I guess, not even camaraderie, but 
people being in positions of power to push the button and say yes? For sure. Uh, Atlanta, 100 percent. Um, moving there more full time here in the next couple of months. Houston, D.C., D.C. for sure. You know, I still live in D.C. and I love D.C. D.C. you can do it. Um, Milwaukee, like mentioned, uh, St. Paul, Minnesota has a black mayor. So there's there's actually a, a list of like black mayors that you can look up. Um, and I, w- I would start there. I haven't actually done it, but that's something practical you could do. It's like look at the list of black mayors, see where they are, see what their terms are, because if they're leaving soon, it might not matter as much. Mm-hmm. But if they just got elected or something, hey, start building those relationships now. You start building with those black mayors, they have the people and the teams that can start to move things around. And that's where I will align myself. One of the biggest opportunities for emerging developers and even solidified developers like myself are those municipalities and the partnerships. Best way, I talked about it on the last one, public-private partnerships are key. But there are a lot of black people getting in these positions of power that are vested in the equality in, hey, I'm not going to select you because you're black. I'm going to select you because you're good, but you also are black and you have mission too. So we have an, uh, an aligned mission. Um, okay. So talk about, talk about it a little bit, but let's go into this community development versus commercial real estate. Community development is what is community development? What does that even mean? Community development is where you are primarily working. So commercial development in general is like, the creation of something right so if you look at commercial real estate is the traditional profit capitalist type of system it's, it's for profit entities yes like office buildings yes office buildings, grocery stores gross yeah retail multifamily that's not subsidized anything that's not subsidized is just for profit it's commercial real estate that's commercial real estate. housing is commercial real estate as yeah, well absolutely okay but community development there are elements of commercial real estate that could be subsidized so the loan comes out in tax credit mm-hmm. so housing is also commercial real estate so like building that grocery store the city came in and subsidized so that's more com- community development work so you're doing it not necessarily for profit, but you're doing it for mission. That's the stark difference. And the mechanics of how the finance works is completely different. So how, how do they work? On the market rate side, it's really simple. If you got, if you have a $100 million deal, we talked about, going, if you haven't watched last episode, make sure you check it yeah. out. If you got a $100 million deal, let's say you get $70 million of debt. That's just, is what it is. Those are the terms. You need $30 million of equity. If you need this $30 million of equity, there's a system where the general partner could come in I'm going to bring 10% of the equity. You're going to bring 90. It's just like the private equity funds. It's, it's all the same, whether it's business or in real estate, it's the same structure. So I'm going to bring 3 million and you are going to bring 27. We're going to get this debt of 70. We're getting this deal done. Simple. It's really in the numbers rooted in that allow that to work. Everyone gets their return. It hits the metrics, et cetera, et cetera. Community development is when that system doesn't work. You can't hit those returns, but just because you can't hit that return, does that mean you shouldn't be able to build in these communities? No, like you have to be able to build in all of the communities, regardless of the income that is driving it. So community development is really a system that allows for people like myself to go in and like develop in communities where the incomes don't work. Interesting thing Egbert said once again, I know I keep saying his name, but Think about a flight, right? We fly all the time. I know y'all fly just as much as I do. You bought your flight three months ago. You bought your flight two months ago. I bought my flight yesterday. Yours is 100. Yours is 200. Mine is 500. We all in the same row. At the end of the day, no matter how much you paid, it shouldn't determine the quality of the service and what you have. So the way I look at housing is the exact same way. Just because you make $30,000 or you might make $20,000 and I might make a million dollars doesn't necessarily mean you should live in a $30,000 apartment, right? Like, frankly, teachers, lawyers, no, teachers, police officers, et cetera, like they are doing the public good. They're no worse than a celebrity that may be an athlete. Like we have to be able to create something for them too. Is the reason- So that's community development. Is the reason you don't see more people doing it in your opinion because of the profit margins are not the highest? More people in general, yes. More of us, no. 
the predominantly white people that's been doing development forever, yeah, it's like it's not worth the brain damage and the headache. It's a lot of work. And the profit margins aren't as consistent. It's not as um, streamlined as commercial real estate. It's just nuts and bolts over there. If you got the money, you got the land, you buy it, you don't have to go through the red tape. Over here, it's full of red tape. So, And it's not guaranteed that you'll be able to move forward on it. Like there's variables that are outside of your hands. So yes, that's why a lot of people don't do it that are doing this commercial real estate stuff. Now, I think a lot of us don't do it because of education and like, that's it. I think way more of us would do it if we knew one, it existed and two, figured out a way to start to do it. When I mean, we talked about the numbers last time, like there's a real life, use, real life use case where in five years you could be worth 10 figures getting into this space, even in community development exclusively. Now, again, I don't think that's the best business to just build. If you want to like sustain in business, you should diversify, but yeah, it's, a, it's a good place to be. So are you actively buying land as part of this development or? Great question, man. Uh, buying, no, getting control. Yes. So those are two different things. So how do you, how do you get control without buying? Purchase and sell contract that allows you to wait until you have your plan in order or your finances in order to be able to buy. So can you explain that? Absolutely. Uh, they always say, don't wait to buy land, buy land and wait. That's like the big Instagram thing, right? I disagree. Fundamentally, I disagree. I know that's probably, I'm a minority in this, but buying and sitting on land is not a smart decision as it relates to investing. You can put your money other places in stocks, in bonds, et cetera, even in flipping some real estate, whatever, because development is sexy. So many people just want to go out and say, I'm doing this, this, that. When you watch the people talking about buying land, don't look for the people that say, I bought this land or I'm about to do this with it. Look for the people that finished it. Because a lot of those people that are saying we're about to do this never get to the other side of it. They don't come back for a second interview and say, hey, that building is built. You can look at it. They don't have the same receipts. And during that process, there's holding costs, there's insurance, there's risk. Like most of the time, buying land is not a good investment unless you have a surplus of cash that you're just sitting on. If you got money and it's just like right there waiting and you need tax shelters or anything like that, cool. You should do that. But someone that is trying to get in a space like that's not the best way to enter into this market at all. So, no, I don't buy land. I like to get it under contract. I'll go and work with a municipality. Those are the best people to work with. Uh, when they are in sync, because when they're not, it's tough. Or you can work with a private seller that understands, like, realistically, nobody else is going to buy this. So one of the things I read, I think it was in the People's Principles, was like, your price, my terms. All right, cool. You want 500000 for this land. I'll give you the 500000 but I'm going to need 18 months to close. You've been sitting on it for five years. What's the difference? Give me 18 months. I may give you 10000 to put down. You know, after six months, I'll give you another twenty five. That may go hard because I think my plan is moving forward. But I'm not giving you 500000 until everything I know for my exit is in place. Or if you buy land that's 500000 but you know it's worth $5 million, your exit is in place right there, then you could buy it quickly. I'm not buying land until my exit is in place, period. Never, never enter an investment before you know the exit. Not doing it. Simple principle. I'll lock it up, but I'm not buying it. So how are you moving into different markets? Like, What are some of the challenges with that? You started where you're from. But now you're going to Texas and you're going to, you said you're moving to Atlanta and different things like, and then you're doing different, different product types as well. Yeah. So talk about navigating that. So relationships, man, it's, it's, it's everything. I think when I was coming up in Milwaukee, one of the things that I did was just build those relationships. I was networking. I was at every event. You couldn't miss me. I was, literally, you could not miss me. I was everywhere. Uh, so I took that same model, but now I'm doing it on a national scale. Everything in D.C., real estate based events, I'm there. I'm not there as much now because I've been, you know, head down, but I'm in those Atlanta based events. I'm in that Houston based events. I'm in those, you know, Birmingham based events. I'm in that. So I look for the macroeconomic trends that I like population growth. Um, I really like red states and blue cities because it allows for 
flexibility and um, getting out tenants that may not pay, right? I'm not saying evict folks. That's not what I'm here for. But at the same time, places like uh, Atlanta. Atlanta isn't as bad. Atlanta's D.C. Let's use D.C. for example. You said red state and blue city. Yes, those are places like Atlanta I like. Like Houston, uh, Houston, Atlanta. Houston, Georgia is now. Birmingham. Georgia, Birmingham. So all, blue state. All blue states, red city. Yeah. I mean, I mean, sorry. traditionally, Georgia's not a blue state, though. No, no, no. I mean, blue cities, red states. I may have said it the wrong way. So Birmingham would be. Yeah. Birmingham, Birmingham Houston, Birmingham, Atlanta, Atlanta, Atlanta. Houston, Houston. Yeah, for sure. New Orleans. Yes. Stuff like that. Yep, yes. yep, yep. I really like blue states, red cities. Sorry. Blue cities red states yep. because the the higher level laws allow for more flexibility like a place like dc for example there were people that literally dc prior to the pandemic you can go rent an apartment never pay your rent and you don't have to get out for at least seven months because that's how long the process takes like i know people that lived in a building that i lived in that literally leased it and didn't pay rent they just lease it out every summer so they can enjoy the rooftop and they just burn up different people's things like, okay, your name this year, we all gonna live there. Your name this year, we all gonna live there. Are there any <laughs> are there any major cities that are run by Republicans? I don't think so, right? Most uh, every major city is run by Democrats. You really think about it. That's a good From question. Chicago, LA, New That's York, wrong. Miami, Houston. Miami is a Democrat. They were, um the mayor's a Democrat. I don't think there's any major city that's that That's interesting. I just thought about that. Yeah. No no major city has Demo has very Republican true. control. Very true. Chicago is Democrat. Yeah. Even that even if it's in a Republican true. state. LA. Yeah. San Francisco. San Francisco, same. Yeah. Philly. Yeah. And, you know, Pennsylvania goes back and forth. But those those cities, those states that have those very, like, stringent laws, like a D.C., for example, um, I, I'm, I'm not the most fond of, right? Like, during the pandemic, there were people that literally lived for over a year just because of the system. And it's like, you're not paying any rent. As a landowner that has thousands of units i don't want thousands of units in a place that i can't get people exploiting this system out in wisconsin you get somebody 30 days all right boom you go through the process atlanta even quicker than that and i'm not saying we should exploit it either mm -hmm. but from a business perspective it doesn't make sense for me to be in a place where x amount of people don't pay rent especially as i'm rising like when i get bigger of course maybe I could deal with some of that drop, but right now, no, nah, I'm focused on cities where it makes sense financially. So you moved throughout the cities. I know the HUD is involved in the Birmingham situation. There was 370 million allocated uh, yep. for for the developments. Is it a situation where you can now again go back to HUD and do the same type of proposal in a different city? Absolutely. So I have I'm a finalist for three cities right now. <laughs> See, I, I knew it, man. <laughs> I knew. It. I'm a finalist for three cities right now. I got a call yesterday about one. We'll talk about the cities offline. Um, yeah. So the the strategy and the game plan there is if, let's say, once a year, once every other year, I can pick up one of these, Birmingham will be further along. Mm -hmm. Now I'm starting on that. And if each one is kicking out a 1,000-plus units, you get three, four cities. I mean, by the time – I'm 34 now. By the time I'm 42, 43, I'll have – thousands of units under my belt that I've developed and really just starting to enter my prime. Yeah. From, yeah. On your financial map, does the percentage change with the amount of units, right? When you started at the 140, you had your percentage that was put in. Now you're doing 1100, but you have partners. Yes. How does that change? Great question. Yes, it did change. So each city that you go into, their housing authority that you, so all of these are public housing redevelopment. So think of Brittany Greens, um, think uh, Marcy Projects, et cetera. We're taking the projects and creating mixed income communities. Because if you think about the projects, they were low density. So it's 30 acres of land with 300 units on it. That same 30 acres could do 3,000 if you really wanted to, right? But you don't want to dense, you don't want to go that dense. But that's just an example of like, the what you are going after so because the housing authorities typically own those lands whoever is at the housing authority they kind of dictate the negotiation of you like the housing authority and developer in those terms the housing authority gets x percentage and then the developers gets y percentage and right now integral and i are splitting that percentage okay but it's very favorable like it's pretty close to um where it should be and the, the way we work they come 
I'm driving, but they're there every step of the way in the passenger seat. So I'm able to learn from it in their experience. They've developed, built, and managed over 10,000 plus units. They've been doing this. They created the model. I'm learning from them, but I'm driving the, the, the ship at the same time. So yes, I have to share in the economics, but you know, three, $400 million deals a pop. I don't mind sharing. We can figure it out. So talk about access to capital. That's something that, you know, Don people, a lot of people have talked about. Um, what is your thoughts on access to capital as far as on the real estate development side? And what's your personal experience is trying to get access to capital? The money on this commercial real estate side, like I said, the money is going to be there. If you got to deal to work, the money's going to flow at the end of the day. Now, the terms for the money I talked about before, that's where it gets a little tricky. I'll say in the wake of George Floyd, there was a 18 month period maybe even a little, I mean, it's still kind of there, but it's scaling back where they were throwing money at black developers. Who, who's throwing money? Like BlackRock? Uh, no, that's a great question. So like the PayPal's of the world, when they was giving out all of the like, oh, I want to invest in black communities, primarily went to CDFIs, Community Development Financial Institution that we talked about last time. There's some national CDFIs that govern some of those funds and they've been able to kind of distill those funds to us. So like enterprise community partners, they're my equity investors on the Madison deal. They have a program called Equitable Path Forward. Their CEO just took over Fannie Mae. So that's the scale of like how big these CDFIs are. Now, um, they're one of their presidents, Lori Chapman, she created this program based upon all of that money that was coming in from the corporations that were trying to give to black dollars. And this program is specifically created to be able to they have lines of credit for us from an operational business perspective. They have pre-development loans. So you can go out, each one of these deals, you need at least a half a million, anywhere from a half a million to a million before you close. You get it all back when you finish, but you need that before you close. So when you talk about like capacity, that's one of the things too. Mm -hmm. If you have five of these deals going on at one time, you're gonna need two and a half to $5 million worth of capital just to deploy to that not even talking about your operations and nothing like that. So they have programs that are allowing for developers to be able to tap into those type of money that helps us grow and scale. Um, but the flip side of it is that's all the, you know, kind of feel good money that's going to flip. But to, to Don people's point, black people don't manage big pension funds at all. Right. He, he's, I've heard him talk about it on y'all's platform. At the end of the day, we're less than 1% of all of the management, black, brown, women, less than 1% of all assets managed. But if in New York, for example, with black, brown and women is over 50% of what's going into that pension fund. Why is it less than 1% of us managing or having access to manage those funds? What is the governance around that to say, oh, you are not capable enough to do that? That's still a really big challenge to be able to even go from someone like myself, that's a developer that's established to get into fund management and be able to allocate to either my developments or other developers in the same way that some of these traditional majority firms are doing with no problem. So that's really a challenge that I think needs to be addressed. And I'm doing, I'm doing my job to do it. So reinvest is a platform that I'm creating now. It's a crowdfunding platform that democratizes commercial real estate investment. My mother can invest, your parents can invest unless they are accredited historically. But you've seen crowdfunding start to grow in the real estate space a little bit. So I'm doing a regulation A plus. We can raise up to 75 million. I'm gonna put a portfolio of deals together and have people invest in that and backed by the best of the best in the country that are doing it. So it's secure by those funds. I mean by those firms. And we underwrite the deals, we co-invest in the deals. It's not a it's not like investing in a company. It's not like investing in a onesie deal. Like we are, you know, putting together sophistication in a way that the marketplace has not seen. So that's one of the ways that I'm addressing the access to capital challenge for emerging developers that are like me and coming up behind me too. Let's talk about the emerging developers. I would imagine since your episode, people have looked at it oh. as an option or even a, a pathway as, as a career. So what are some, some resources? I know you gave something great about, you know, finding cities with black mayors. What are some other resources that you would recommend to, to people who are in this space and are looking at, like, I want to be the next Brandon Rule? 
Yeah. I think one of the best ways is as you drive around in neighborhoods and you see buildings, look at those signs. Every one of those buildings have a has a ton of signs up that has every single company name on it. Those are the people doing the developments. What better place should you start than your backyard with folks that are doing the work right now? Start there first. Like someone in Milwaukee, they're going to see a rural enterprise sign. Someone in Des Moines, Iowa, I, I, I'm not working there. I can't help them in the same way. And the rural enterprise of Des Moines may not be black, but they know their stuff. It's about knowledge and education at the end of the day. Like the black thing is an enhancer, but the barrier to entry is just education and knowing what it is. So start with looking at very practical way. When you drive around, take a picture of the signs, look them up, find people on LinkedIn, whether they're black, women, find some commonality and try to, you know, get in with them, whether it be the architect, the construction company, the engineers or the developer. All of them work with developers all the time. They know developers don't say, oh, I don't want to reach out to the architect because I don't want to do that. Architects build for developers. Literally, they have a whole network of them. So if you build a rapport with one, they can introduce you to their Rolodex. So that's one of the ways um, I'm also looking at since that episode, people come to me all the time. Yo, put some out, put some out, put some out, put some out. So like I've been I, I've been against the course thing. I, that's not my thing because you can't put together a course and someone comes out and becomes a developer. That's not a thing. You can go, I said it last time, but you can go to the best schools and universities in the country for the commercial real estate programs and not be a developer when you come out. So I'm looking at like putting together a community of folks, like really to bring resources and all of this, whether you're in Chicago or in LA or in Atlanta, you can network and get the education, but then also look at kind of local networks as well to build with people that are like-minded. So that's another way. Uh, that'll be through the Rosa Groove that I put out. Finally, I'm putting together my podcast. Y'all inspire me to make sure I'm finally <laughs> put it out. <laughs> so that, but um, in general, I think researching, man, like right now, YouTube University, EYL University, it's a lot of information out here that you can find like for free. You know, that the game that I gave on the last episode is a great way to get into it. You know, write down literally those things as some of the other people that have done, they are now working with developers now, like at development shops. There are people that started their own development companies. There are people that won RFPs that there are test, live, living testimonies of folks that like right. lives have changed because of that episode and the platform that you all created. So I think leveraging resources in every aspect of the way is really how you do it. Is affordable housing from a developer perspective? Just from a... okay social perspective yeah is it beneficial in closing the wealth gap oh or does it just keep status quo you're doing yeah. a good thing by providing a service for people yeah but i just i don't know if that is something it's yeah, like exactly it's like saying. welfare right well welfare is beneficial yes. you need assistance yes but it's you, you're kind of staying at this level yes. right yeah you 100 percent right so affordable housing in the traditional sense, most people think of Section 8, you know, all of that stuff. But if y'all notice, like, for the most part, I do mixed income housing. So I have market rate units in pretty much all of my deals. It may be 60% or 70% affordable. It may be 20% market. And even the affordability is at different levels. It's 30% of the AMI, which is low income at Section 8. You got it at 50, 60% of the AMI, which is typically your workforce so your barista at the local coffee shop or you you know your teacher etc they live there as well but then the market rate folks that may be at six figures plus are also in these buildings i build in areas that are predominantly market rate so like the water street building that i'm putting up right now it'll be done really at the end of this month but people start moving in next month that building right next door is a ton of condos right across the street a ton of condos there were 50 people in opposition every single community meeting we have for that deal because they didn't want them around. They thought of like this negative stigma of affordable housing. Again, what I'm doing is mixed income housing. So like the people that are living in that condo can actually live here too, if they want to sell their condo and move and it's just as quality. So when you have a mixed income in one group, that's where you have the different levels of collaboration. It's kind of like UIL, right? Think about InvestFest. There are people super low income, there are people median income, and there are people extremely high income. That's the melting pot of success 
If you just continuously have affordability at this level and below, we never get out of that because you never see, you never learn, you never grow. Y'all are the living example of really the answer to your question. You got to see something to believe in. And if you just keep that concentration of poverty together, no, that is not the answer at all. This, this is why you text me. <laughs> this is why you text me after the, the the segment that we were going back and forth on Market Mondays. That's right. And then I was trying. It, it was kind of like the, the first thing is like let's have our basic needs met, and then let's be inspired. So both, I think both both, both points are, are pretty valid. You did the, the the mixed units, but there's there's also different types of real estate that that you you're invested in now. So let's talk about what the portfolio is going to be looking like in the next five ten years. Yeah, great question. Uh, diversification from a geographic perspective, I kind of outlined. But to your point, I'm looking at other things. I think development in general right now is down. Like real estate is cyclical. There's four cycles. Like we're not in a good one right now. Um, I won't say not in a good one. We're just in one that's historically like bad, right? You just have to know what to do within that cycle. So right now what I'm really looking at is multifamily acquisitions. Like how do I go? Yes, I got a couple thousand units in my pipeline that I'm developing over the next eight to 10, that'd take a long time. But how do I buy 5,000 units in the next five years? Acquisitions, you can buy that. Like literally the formula on the commercial real estate side, again, is simple, hundred million dollars. I'm getting 70 of debt. I need 30 million equity. I need to bring 3 million to the table. So really through the various platforms and initiatives, we can start to identify that 3 million so I can bring and find the 27 that can then fund the $100 million deal. From an acquisition perspective, if I can scale that up, it creates a level of balance, like not just affordability because for developers are very like asset rich, balance sheets crazy, but like cash poor. I just said it takes 500000 to a million dollars a deal. So if you got five of them things, no matter how wealthy you are, at a certain point, it's like my cash is low. But the thing about the value add stuff, I had a friend, um, Venus, she bought a deal right outside of Atlanta. I think it was $40 million in 2021 and sold it for $120 in like, or 20, 2020 and sold it 18 months later for like $120. So you look at opportunities from a value add perspective, if you know how to underwrite them and look for the right things, there's class C and D properties that really need the same level of care that some of these new developments are getting. You go in, you put in the rehab money, you go fix it up. Now it's a B, B plus, A minus. Now you're cranking out income equivalent to the new construction stuff that's out there at a fraction of the cost. So the value here is probably just less than the value there, but your basis for getting in is here. So that spread is yours. So I'm really looking at it from like that perspective from a multifamily acquisition play, developing some studios in Atlanta. Um, hopefully by the time this comes out, I can make a formal announcement, but two um, really, really big, you know, partners in conversations with there. Uh, industrial, that was one of the best asset classes in the pandemic across anything. I mean, didn't matter stocks, bonds, real estate, don't matter. Industrial real estate was toe to toe with anything else you put up there. So when you look at that, it's like, okay, regardless of anything that's going on in capital markets, um, this specific thing is, is booming. And for production in Atlanta, it's the new Hollywood, right? Like literally it's the new Hollywood. They have a 30% tax credit. If you do a hundred million dollar production in Atlanta, you get 30 million back. That's why they're there. So from a resident, from a development perspective, my partners, Egbert and those guys, they develop uh third rail studios, ended up selling it and whatnot. But, the Rocks movie Rampage was filmed there. Ozark was filmed there. Like that's the quality of productions that'll be coming out of these studios. So studios, I think is a huge opportunity in Atlanta. It'll get saturated in a little bit, but right now it's, it's time to strike. So what about the uh, Choice Neighborhood Implementation Grant? What's that deal? So that's that's the Birmingham, man. Uh, that 370 million that they put, it was from the federal government. So last time we did a deep dive on tax credits, but I think this time we should definitely highlight this fact i won a 50 million dollar grant granted it was a team 
But I, when I did that interview two and a half years ago, I didn't know I could win a $50 million grant. I had no clue that there was a $50 million grant exists that Brandon Rule could be a part of. But now it's like, oh, I do. So the Choice Neighborhood Implementation Grant is that 50 out of the 370. It was the highest one that got, we got the biggest check. Some people got 50, some got 40, some got less. But um, it allows you to redevelop these communities. And when I talked about the capital stack earlier, on the community development side, the value is here, but the cost is here. That 50 million plugs in that Delta. It's Where, a grant. Where's the grant from? The state? Federal. Uh, federal? Yeah. yeah. So that's when Secretary Fudge yeah. came down, brought the check. Federal government, every year they put it out. They just actually announced yesterday that they have, I forget the exact number, but they're putting out, I think it was 250 or so million. So how can people find actually. grant information? Like how can you even know? Google them? Choice, that specific one, Choice Neighborhood Implementation Grant. They have a planning grant too that cities typically go and like that's up to 500,000 where they pay different consultants to put together their plan. But that 50 million is, is huge. Yeah. I mean, and, and relationships again, like you said, the, the fact that the mayor knew the secretary of HUD and the fact that the secretary of HUD looks like us yeah. helps. Absolutely. In two years, that might not be the case. It's, it's time to strike or at least learn because in eight years it might be the case again. Exactly. But you'll be prepared once you put yourself in that position. Like my preparation really is what's manifesting itself into what we are starting to see today. Like I, if it wasn't for me doing those tax credit deals, I wouldn't be able to do this master plan stuff. But I know how to do each individual deal. So now when I'm putting together seven, it's like I know how to do each individual one, but let me put together the plan for the seven. Now I got integral and partnerships to be able to help streamline yeah. that process. Too. Prepared yourself for the moment. That's right. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Another gym pack session. So I know you say you got the podcast coming. What else you want to leave the people with? Uh, yeah, check out the Rose of Grew. So that'll be the podcast. When's it come out? I'm rocking it. Uh, by the end of the year, let's just say that. What's it about? Real estate? Oh. Yeah, primarily real estate. Originally, it was like entrepreneurship. I thought about it in like 2015. It okay. was like EYL, honestly, but I just was crazy busy yeah. like legit if you go back to facebook in 2015 you'll see like posts that was uh, i think I, I saw it, you was sitting on the couch it was very dark yeah yeah i mean yeah <laughs> video quality was trash yeah, yeah you know? I, I, saw, I watched yeah it. <laughs> so you know i was i was trying to do some stuff back then but um now i think just market conditions right like there's there's a source for that now which i love and that's what i appreciate y'all for because i only wanted to do it because i was coming up as a developing entrepreneur and like yo i don't see this but y'all did it. It's like, perfect. Okay, so I feel like there's a real estate void, too, in a way that I think I could fill it. So that's primarily what it's about. So I'll be doing some entrepreneurs, but mainly, yeah, it'll be real estate based. And then also uh, reinvest is this crowdfunding platform that will be for developers. But one of the things that I created, um, and investors, but one of the things I created on there was a real estate calculator. So when I talk about the financial model and whatnot, I literally built out a whole financial model in a user interface that you can just plug in the purchase price, plug in the, the um, amount of rent, plug this in, and it spit out all of the stuff for you. So that'll be on reinvest, and that's for that's just free gem for the people. All right, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Make sure you follow my guy. What's your Instagram? B underscore R U L E B rule on all platforms. I need some good brothers, man. I one last thing I'll say behind the scenes. Y'all some really good brothers. We don't talk every day, but you know what I'm saying? It's been stand-up and genuine from the beginning. So um, I know y'all might see them with the celebrities and whatnot, but these are the same brothers I met, you know, almost three years ago at this point. So appreciate thank y'all for being here. Appreciate, appreciate, appreciate you. Appreciate it. All right, guys. Thank you for rocking with us. We'll see you next week. Peace. Peace.